What we're doing, we're hoping to do, is capture a wolf spider hunting in high speed that is in slow motion. Hey! Oh, you little bugger. So what we've done is, because that individual wolf spider continued to run away as soon as we lifted the container, we're trying a different individual. Um, hopefully this personality is a little bit different. This one might stay put. So far, so good. Rolling. No. Ah, oh, same behaviour as that first one. How about a portrait instead? A bug wrangler is a, is a bit hard to define. There's a lot to animal wrangling. It's not just grabbing an animal and, and, and making it do something. Now you're going to tell me she's not on my back, aren't you? I often struggle when um, people ask me to pop my uh, occupation down. I do so many things related to invertebrates and bug wrangling is one of them. But essentially, um, I see it as uh, um, enabling natural behavior to be captured by, uh, on, on video. Um, so basically, uh, working with the animals, um, controlling them in some ways and just allowing them to behave naturally in others um, to enable uh, certain behaviours to be, be documented. Climatic hardships created an evolutionary nursery without parallel. So many flowers eager to attract pollinators have fostered a matching diversity of insects. Many, like these jewel beetles, are rewarded with nectar. But some plants show even greater entrepreneurial flair. You know, most people wouldn't be aware that a lot of um, the smaller wildlife are shot in, in situations like this. And we've had various reactions. Most people are fascinated and, and really go, wow, wow, what, what's that all about? You, you, you for real? Some people go, oh, it's kind of destroyed it for me. Or some people say, oh, so it's faked. We, we're not faking behaviours on, on set. My role really is to make sure that the animal is feeling that comfortable, that it's behaving completely naturally and it's okay. oblivious to everything around it. Bits and pieces. Anything goes, prop things up. That's my role as an animal wrangler to create such an environment that uh, whatever species we're working with is not, you know, not petrified, it's just relaxed, it's going to court with its, its potential partner, it's going to lay its eggs, it's going to do whatever it does without thinking I'm in a, some, an artificial area. So, uh, and that takes a lot of insight into knowing the sorts of things that that animal's going to respond to or, or ignore. It's not impossible to film invertebrates um, in the wild, but it is quite difficult. And one of the big reasons is the size. They're quite small. And when we're looking at them through magnified lenses, the depth of field, the area of focus that we have is sometimes only millimeters deep. So that means that if that animal's moving, if it's on a leaf blowing in the wind, we almost don't have it in focus going in and out and in and out. It would make you seasick seeing this coming in and out and people would be watching it saying, look, it's not in focus half the time. So to, to get these things in focus and be on the same level of pro or in terms of production quality as what we're seeing with the larger animals, the lions and the tigers and all the other stuff, we need to be able to do it under controlled environments so we're not having rain beating down and wind blowing them so we can focus and get different angles. The sets we uh, build um, are quite varied. Sometimes we do really simple, natural ones. What, what we've got behind me is, is the beginnings of a fairly natural set where we just use leaf litter and natural elements of the particular habit, habitat we're modeling. Um, and sometimes we might create something. So if we're going to film an animal that's living underground, we'll create an artificial burrow so that we can get the appearance of looking into its life underground. Thank you. 
whatever that might mean, roots poking in and, and soil and things like that. And we've got to take into account that we want the animal to be happy in there, but we've also got to allow lights and cameras to get in there too. So it's balancing all those, those elements. But uh, yeah, little, little bits and pieces. And sometimes these sets are so small, it only takes a few tiny elements to, to create a whole world. I ended up working in a wildlife park to start with, so working with wildlife. My first wrangling job uh, just fell at my feet at that point when a, uh, a band called Hunters and Collectors came to the park to do a video clip for their song Holy Grail and they wanted a spider to run through the frame and the park managers knew that I was a bit of a spider buff so they went and uh, I said, can you provide a huntsman for us? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I brought in a, a spider and just got it to run across the screen. And that was my first experience with, yeah, well, it was pretty simple back then. But then uh, later I started working with natural history so programs. You can see there's a bat pattern in the behavior already. So if we were getting a running through shot, that'd be perfect. If a director was saying we want the spider running down, I'd be uh, explaining to them that that would be working against what it normally wants to do. So, so you can see it's quite happy to toddle up the stick, but um, it'd be a bit harder to get it to walk back the other way. I have a, a friendly flying fox with me at the moment. You happen to have a flying, flying fox, fox handy. <laughs> handy here. I mean, this is one of the one of the animals which has been most persecuted in the, in the whole of Australian history, yet it's probably Australia's most intelligent. Definitely the pinnacle is uh, David Attenborough's programs. We've lucky to worked on three of those now. And look, I grew up idolising David Attenborough. So just to have now worked uh, on his programs has, has just been a, a life goal. Um, and I just, yeah, it's like, yeah, <laughs> what do you say? Uh, is an absolute idol. We were lucky enough to meet him in person um, a few years back. He's just an incredible man and uh, yeah, I pretty much owe my entire career to him. Um, it, Would you like me to? No, uh, no, I'm okay. quite... <laughs> <laughs> he decides that my little finger is more muscular than my other finger, I gather. Um, Probably spiders is my favourite group, I'd say. Um, um, I've been working with spiders for a long, long time. And within that group, um, look, I mean, it's really hard. I enjoy working with insects and all sorts, but um, probably huntsman spiders would be the, the little subgroup of all that, that are my favourites. When I was really young, I found that because of the reaction to family members, I was a little fearful of spiders to start with, but that fear grew into fascination and uh, that's just, grown and grown so now I really uh, find them a, an, an endearing group of animals and huntsmen are probably right up at the top of that. I remember a few years ago one of the UK film companies contacted us prior to a shoot and had all their uh, um, risk analysis and they had all the spiders listed and wanted us to isolate and I said you know when it came down to it reality is that uh, tripping over a cord or electrocuting yourself or having a car accident on the way to the shoot is far more dangerous than working with any of the spiders we had. Because education and positive education underpins everything we do at Mini Beast Wildlife uh, um, there are certain requests that we get for invertebrate use that we just decline straight up and that's anything that's just using them to terrorise other people or to poke fun at the animals. Um, so um, in some of these celebrity shows that want buckets of bugs or uh, those sorts of things we, we just say no that's not, not for us. The next week they'll shed their skin. 
and then we've got to separate them because then they start eating each other. So. We get all sorts of requests from production companies and sometimes they'll come to us with a concept, sometimes they'll come to us with a weird request of a particular animal. Uh, so yeah, so we'll assess it there and then if, if we think that that's doable, then we'll go about seeking to, to get that particular species in. Many of the species we work with are nocturnal, um, not all, but um, many of them. So when we're going looking for these animals, we often go out at night time to, uh, to seek them out. And, uh, and that's when the, the forest comes to life, particularly here in the, the wet tropics in the, in the rainforest. Natural history documentaries definitely do change attitudes. Um, and it gives people an insight into a, the, the animal's behaviour that they wouldn't have necessarily beforehand. But also, you get to see the detail of the animals, and particularly invertebrates, um, we don't see that in everyday life. So with a larger animal, we all know what lions and tigers and, and large mammals and, and most of the birds look like. We see them at a distance of a, uh, you know, X feet, metres in the zoo, and we, we can see them in their entirety. But when you see a spider on the wall, Generally, people don't get close enough to appreciate the fine detail and all the structures that are just fascinating with them. That's what natural history programs bring, that insight, that window into the, 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 their lives, seeing those behaviours, but seeing those structures and the intricate nature of their bodies close up. That, and, and that's the thing that people go, wow, that, that is a really fascinating animal.